The method of unveiling Christ is tremendous. Christians all over the Roman Empire were suffering because of their affiliation with Christ. Their cases seemed hopeless. They needed a glimpse of Jesus. That which engaged the prophet's immediate attention were seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. They were made of gold, and since this is the most precious metal, the gold could well represent the righteousness of God. However, the unique manifestation of this vision was not the churches themselves, but rather the one who allowed himself to be in their midst. John refers to him by the use of the title, the Son of Man, which Jesus used of himself nearly 70 times in the four Gospels. See how the righteousness of God is illustrated. The girdle is made entirely of gold. This represents the righteousness and faithfulness of God. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 5. Christ portrayed the Son of Man among the lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Verse 13. One of the important features of this record is that although Jesus Christ is God the Son, enthroned in his glorified state, he still refers to himself as the Son of Man. Jesus maintains his link with the human family. He is forever our elder brother, limited by his human flesh. What a comfort to his people amid their tribulation upon this earth. The one above who represents us is the man Christ Jesus. He possesses the same nature and has met the same temptations that afflict all mankind. He is therefore an understanding and sympathetic high priest. Jesus Christ stands among the lampstands. These lampstands represent the seven churches, verse 20, that is, the church of God on earth. Therefore, this imagery depicts Jesus in the midst of his people. Lo, I am with you always, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. John's description of Christ is sevenfold. The color of his hair expressed the thought that divine wisdom is pure. Nothing can be hid from the scrutiny of his fiery eyes. His feet, like pillars of fire, seem to indicate strength before which nothing can stand in his path. David says, The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Psalm 93 verse 4 His majestic voice could well be a representation of his supreme rulership and power. He is in complete control and he holds in his right hand those in authority in the churches. It is apparent that the use of the right hand is intended to portray the fact of Christ's honor and his great authority. Psalm 110 verse 1 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. The human leaders are to shine. Their source of light and truth is Jesus Christ. It is interesting that whatever God does is accomplished by the power of his word. This two-edged sword symbolizes Christ's authority to judge and his power to execute judgment effectively. See how Christ's ministers, the stars, are contrasted with the brilliant light like the midday sun on Christ's face. It is important to be held in Christ's right hand. Shining as the stars is an indication that the main business of his ministers is to point people to the righteousness of Christ, the only method whereby a person can be converted and disentangled from his sins. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3, James chapter 5 verse 20. Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Thus it symbolizes his relation to the churches. He is in constant communication with his people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion. Although he is high priest and mediator in the sanctuary above, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth. With untiring wakefulness and unremitting vigilance, he watches to see whether the light of any of his sentinels is burning dim or going out. If the candlesticks were left to mere human care, the flickering flame would languish and die. But he is the true watchman in the Lord's house, the true warden of the temple courts. His continued care and sustaining grace are the source of life and light. The symbolism of the sanctuary is designed to represent heaven's very close relationship with believers on earth. The incense offered morning and evening represents both our prayers, Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, and Christ's intercession on our behalf, Revelation chapter 8 verse 3. The showbread symbolizes Christ as he is partaken of by faithful believers on earth, John chapter 6 verses 35 through 63. This sanctuary symbolism demonstrates that Christ's heavenly ministry for us is always dynamically related to his ministry in our hearts. 
Heaven comes down to earth and lifts us up in heart and mind to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Compare chapter 1 verse 3. The message of the candlesticks of Revelation chapter 1 is that, by his death and resurrection, Christ has opened a door into heaven so that members of his church on earth can receive constant increments of his Holy Spirit and be raised in heart above the sickening clamorings of an evil world and the nagging urgings of the demonic forces to fellowship with the Lord of glory who sits enthroned above all principalities and powers. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 Praise the Lord for a Savior who, though infinitely exalted, stoops to heal our sagging souls and to breathe upon us the soothing balm of His sweet spirit. The evidence is clear that John saw Christ clothed in the long, high priestly robe which was worn in the daily or holy place ministry. The golden girdle around his breast was undoubtedly the golden girdle of the ephod. This girdle or sash was worn around the ephod and under the breastplate. It was composed of five colors, gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and white, fine twined linen. Exodus chapter 28 verses 6 through 14. The ephod and the breastplate were of the same five colors. Exodus chapter 28 verses 6 and 15. Therefore, the gold embroidery in the ephod, the girdle of the ephod, and the breastplate, plus the golden chains and settings, for the precious stones gave the impression that the chest of the high priest was clothed in gold. This was certainly the predominating color. John saw Christ dressed in the garments of the high priest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. Revelation chapter 1 verse 14. In scripture, white often symbolizes holiness. Compare Luke 9 verse 29, Mark 9 verse 3, 16 verse 5, Daniel 7 verse 9, 11 verse 35, Isaiah 1 verse 18, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 8, Revelation 15 verse 6, 19 verse 7 and 8. The white hair of the Son of Man is the counterpart of the turban worn by the earthly high priest. Attached to it was the gold plate or holy crown on which were engraved the words, Holy to the Lord, Leviticus chapter 8 verse 9, Exodus chapter 28 verses 36 to 38. Years before John's day, first century Christians had received the message from the book of Hebrews that since the cross we have such a high priest, a minister in the sanctuary, and the true tent which is set up not by the man, but by the Lord. Hebrews 8 verses 1 through 2. Christ our high priest offers in heaven the merits of his sacrifice on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 14. So that he is able to purify our conscience, Sunidesis consciousness, from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Now John is given a vision of that same heavenly high priest, clothed in the original robes of which those of earthly high priests were a copy, carrying on his holy place ministry, fostering the efficiency of the lamps of the sanctuary by daily imparting his spirit to his earthly followers. What a message we have here. It is a sanctuary message which sets the stage for what is to follow in the book of Revelation. So much of Revelation is cast within the context of sanctuary imagery. Here our one great heavenly mediator is depicted as caring tenderly for the spiritual interests of his church, holding the ministry of the church in his right hand, Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and 20, and breathing his spirit upon all willing to receive him. It is a message of forgiveness, cleansing, and spiritual power for all who will surrender to him. The Glorified Christ Revelation chapter 1 verses 13 to 16 is a description of the resurrected glorified Christ a great high priest who ministers and reigns over the house of God. Eight descriptors are presented and we should be aware that the number eight in scripture is a number frequently associated with resurrection and regeneration. These descriptors are replete with sanctuary imagery as is the entire book of Revelation. 1. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 13. This represents kingly and priestly dignity. It applies to Jesus as a king priest of the order of Melchizedek the priest king of ancient Salem. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. 2. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. This does not indicate decay or senility, but the sign of venerable knowledge, mature judgment, solid wisdom, and purity of mind. This reminds us of the white turbans worn by the priests in the, ta in the tabernacle. 3. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Verse 14. Christ sees both the good and also the evil to which he is opposed and he aims to annihilate. 
There were several fires burning in the earthly sanctuary, including on the altar of burnt offering and the golden altar of incense, as well as the seven lamps of the lampstand. 4. His feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. This suggests the treading down and destruction of all who choose to sin and also symbolizes his divinity. Most of the pillars of the sanctuary were made of brass. 5. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 15. This conveys Christ's majesty, power, and authority as creator. This also appears to allude to the laver of water in the courtyard of the sanctuary that was used by the priests for ceremonial washings. The Apostle Paul tells us how Jesus sanctifies and cleanses the church with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. Daniel in his last vision in which he saw a similar representation of Christ says that the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. Daniel chapter 10 verse 6. 6. He had in his right hand seven stars. The right hand denotes power, authority, and protection. The fact that the stars are in Jesus' right hand implies a close and protective relationship between Christ and his faithful servants. As the priest cared for the candlesticks and kept them trimmed and lighted, so Jesus cares for his church and the messengers or ministers of the church. The angels of the seven churches represent the pastors or messengers of the church in all ages. The word angel means messenger, in this case human messengers. 7. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. This represents the power of Christ's word, especially in the execution of judgment. The sword of Goliath, which David used to slay him, was kept for a memorial in the tabernacle behind the ephod used by the priests for giving the oracles of God. Paul says that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, and that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. 8. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Verse 16. This signifies Christ's holiness and divinity. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach into. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 16. This reminds us of Moses' face, which after 40 days in God's presence on Mount Sinai shone so radiantly that he was compelled to conceal it with a veil so that the people would not be overcome by his brilliance. Exodus chapter 34 verses 28 through 35. So it is with Jesus' countenance. In the fullness of his divinity in his glorified state, his whole person shines as does the sun. This also reminds us of the Shekinah glory, which represented the divine presence of God that manifested between the cherubim of glory. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5, above the mercy seat, in the holy of holies in the earthly tab tabernacle. There are ten parallels we can discern between Revelation chapter 1 verse 13 through 17 and Daniel chapter 10 verses 5 through 12. Daniel 10 brings to view a person who reveals to Daniel the coming king of the north. This individual is none other than the son of God. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Verse 17. This experience is similar to that of Daniel when Christ appeared to him. The prophet lost his natural strength, but was then given supernatural power. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. That which John experienced as a result of his vision of Christ was nothing unusual. Whenever humanity comes into the presence of divinity, there is the feeling of weakness. There follows the touch of supernatural strength, and usually there is the command to be not afraid. The first and the last. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Verse 17 and 18. The expression the first and the last is drawn from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. In both Isaiah and Revelation chapter 1, it occurs on three occasions. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44 verse 6. I am he. I am the first, I am also the last. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 12. 
The significance of this term is that originally it was used by God expressly to encourage and comfort Israel in the time of, in the time of Isaiah. The prophet was shown that Babylon would become a threat to Israel. Isaiah 39 verses 1 and 2 records the visit of the Babylonians to Jerusalem to inquire about Hezekiah's healing. Overcome by the occasion, Hezekiah disclosed everything he possessed to the Babylonians. The Babylonians would shortly thereafter invade Judah, taking away the spoils that Hezekiah had shown them. Already Hezekiah had experienced a devastating invasion by the Assyrians, only to be miraculously delivered. Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. Now in Isaiah chapters 42 through 45, the prophet declared that through Babylon, though Babylon would conquer God's people, God would ultimately in time overthrow the Babylonians. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 14 and 44 verses 26 through 28. In the midst of this message of deliverance, God titles himself the first and the last. The term means that in the great controversies between Jerusalem and Babylon, between Christ and Satan, God would be both the first and the last on the field of conflict. In other words, he would be completely victorious over his enemies and ultimately destroy them. This same message is conveyed in the book of Revelation. The great controversy between good and evil, the conflict between the church and her enemies, is the theme throughout the book. This theme should underpin the interpretation of every prophetic outline. Thus in the introduction to Revelation, the first and the last is a most fitting and appropriate symbol. Jesus declares himself as victor over the enemies of his people. He is the first on the battlefield. He is fully prepared. He is never taken by surprise. He is also the last on the battlefield, meaning that the enemy has either been put to flight or destroyed. Jesus has been and will be victorious always. Therefore his saints will triumph. The powers of evil will be overcome. Jesus will always be eternally the first and the last. Here Jesus indicates his divinity as he says of himself, I am the first and the last. He is the living one, the source of life. He did die, but never again. He is alive and will be forever. The source of eternal life. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. The Greek renders this passage, I am the living one, yet I became dead, and behold, I am alive, or I am living forever. Here Jesus speaks of himself as the living one. This conveys the notion of continuously living, indicating that Jesus has eternal life in himself. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John chapter 1 verse 4. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. John chapter 1 verse 9. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. John chapter 5 verse 26. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. I became dead, and I am alive forevermore. Greek. What a world of experience is packed into this verse. It alludes to Christ's agonies in Gethsemane and at Calvary as well as to his glorious resurrection and his ascension. The holder of the keys of death and the grave. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The possession of keys represents the possession of authority and power. This passage tells us that Jesus has authority over death and the grave. In scripture the grave is likened to a prison, the prison house of Satan. Satan is the author of death. Him who had the power or dominion of death, that is the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. The grave is Satan's arsenal and stronghold. On this rock will I build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. The gates of Hades represents the stronghold of Satan. The great deceiver claims the dead as his property because they have transgressed the law. In order for Christ to conquer death in the grave, it was essential that he enter the stronghold of Satan and seize the keys of that grim precinct. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Luke chapter 11 verses 21 and 22. By his death Jesus invaded Satan's stronghold. He took part of the same flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had the power or dominion of death, that is the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. This is a defining experience, one of the most dramatic episodes in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It almost goes without saying that Satan mustered all his forces, principalities, and powers to keep Jesus imprisoned in the tomb. Not only were Roman guards keeping their watch, there were unseen watchers as well. Those superhuman angelic powers of darkness were present, unseen to the human eye. Had it been possible, 
the prince of darkness with his host would have kept forever sealed the tomb that held the Son of God. On Calvary, Jesus displayed the marvelous love of God. It was in the tomb that he displayed the omnipotent power of God. In the tomb, the prison house of Satan, Jesus demonstrated his supremacy. Having disarmed principalities and powers of Satan, he made a public, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, margin in himself. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. Revised Standard Version. The devil and all the powers of hell were conquered and disarmed by the dying Redeemer. The Redeemer conquered by dying. Thus his resurrection and ascension are a public, solemn triumph over the principalities and powers of death. It is striking that the heathen oracles were silent soon after Christ's ascension. In his resurrection, Jesus displayed his deity, his creative power, his omnipotence. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Christ is very positive about the accomplishments of his death. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 through 18. His victory was complete. Isaiah had prophesied that the key would be given to him. Isaiah chapter 22 verse 22. The key is a symbol of authority. The Greek term for hell is Hades, meaning the grave. The Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament is Sheol, which also means the grave. Facing death in the grave, as we all do, need not cause us to be fearful. Christ can unlock the grave and restore life to the dead. This he will do at his coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 to 23. The revelations made known to John fit into three categories. Things he had seen things present, and things which were approaching. All these were to be recorded to benefit mankind from John's day to the time when Christ would return. The Seven Stars The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Verse 20 The word angels in the Greek means messenger. In Revelation, the stars are the messengers of the churches. But what do the stars represent? A clue is found in the book of Daniel. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. The term star refers to teachers of righteousness, those who turn men and women away from sin through the preaching of the gospel of Christ. They are God's true and faithful ministers, teachers and servants. That which may have been considered to be mysterious, Jesus explains fully. What is said here prepares the way for the messages to the seven churches which follow in chapters 2 and 3. In summary, the beautiful portrayal of Christ in this chapter shows our Lord to be actively concerned with his people. He walks in their midst. The lampstands refer to the seven churches. The churches do not create the light. Their duty is to hold it forth. The church through its members is to hold forth the word of life. Philippians chapter 2 verse 16. The challenge of the hour is to be a candle holder for the Lord. Our vocation is to display the beauties of Jesus Christ rather than to uncover the blemishes of human nature. The peculiar function of the church is to witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Can we witness for Christ effectively? Of course. Remember John was shown the risen victorious Christ. We can expect success in whatever we attempt to do for God. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chaff. Isaiah chapter 41 verses 14 and 15. In the great controversy between Christ and Satan, we have an ever-present helper. He is in control. He will protect. We will be victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ has given to the church a sacred charge. Every member should be a channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of His grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that the Savior desires so much as agents who will represent to the world His Spirit and His character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women to whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth empowered by him to do a special work, and if she is loyal to him, obedient to all his commandments, 
there will dwell within her the excellency of divine grace. If she will be true to her allegiance, if she will honor the Lord God of Israel, there is no power that can stand against her. Zeal for God and his cause moved the disciples to bear witness to the gospel with mighty power. Should not a like zeal fire hearts with a determination to tell the story of redeeming love of Christ and him crucified? It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Savior. E.G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, pages 635 and 636.